Good afternoon, madam. I appear on behalf of the defendant here in this case today, who is Highclothe Moore Agriculture Limited. The defendant seeks to make an application to set aside the default judgment that was entered on the 24th of August 2020, that was made under the Civil Procedure Rule Part 12, and the defendant's application is made in pursuant to CPR 13.3 and 13.4, and not that the court needs reminding that's listed under this rule, where it states that the court has a discretion to set aside or vary a default judgment if the defendant has a real prospect of successfully defending the claim or it appears to the court that there is some other good reason why and whether the application to set aside the judgment was made promptly. If it may please the court, may I provide a brief summary of the facts? Thank you. The defendant, the defendant is a family-run business using two farm sites in Lincolnshire and has labelled these sites the Greenland and the Blue Land. The defendant grows its potatoes at these sites and then sells them at the end of the annual potato growing season, which is around September. The claimant is a manufacturer of chips potatoes who enters into contracts of sale and delivery with potato farmers. Once the potatoes have been delivered to the claimant's factories, the claimant then makes them into chips, which he packages and sells onto wholesalers or supermarkets. After the claimant approached the defendant and negotiations commenced, a contract was entered into, signed by both the claimant and the defendant on the 4th of March 2019, agreeing for the defendant to sell and deliver to the claimant 100 tonnes of potatoes at £500 per ton at the end of the 2019 growing season, totaling to the amount of £50,000. These potatoes would have to go through a riddling process before being bagged and delivered to the defendant, which is laid out in the contract at Clause 3A, and a copy of this contract is included in the documents, madam. Madam, the defendant had every intention of fulfilling their contractual duties in delivering the potatoes on the agreed date in September and in any ordinary season, this would have been more than possible to satisfy the claimant's requirements. However, towards the end of the growing season, the defendant discovered the potato crop had suffered from an unavoidable disease known as potato blight. This is set out in the report from the UK Association of Soil Science, which is also attached in the document. In effect, madam, the entire potato crop had actually been destroyed and the defendant was unable to deliver a single potato to the claimant, which then led to the defendant being unable to essentially um, fulfil their contractual duties. This appeared to be an issue across the whole of Lincolnshire and also across the north of England, so therefore it did not just affect the defendant. Madam, despite this, the defendant still tried to enter into negotiations with the claimant, but the claimant decided to commence proceedings against the defendant for damages for non-delivery of the potatoes under the contract. Madam, I would now like to move on to CPR 13.3 to address CPR 13.3 1A in providing an account as to why um, the defendant will have um, has a real prospect of successfully defending their claim. Madam, the claim relies upon Section 51.3 of the Sales of Goods Act 1979 for damages for non-delivery and therefore relying upon clause 3 of the contractual agreement made between both the parties that the defendant had an ultimate obligation to deliver those potatoes. The defendant does not dispute that there was a contract, madam, it, which is actually provided of, as mentioned previously, in the document. However, it is the defendant's case that as the unavoidable disease destroyed the potatoes, this was outside of the defendant's control, madam, and therefore this led to the contract actually being frustrated. Therefore, any damage that the claimant had suffered 
Madam was not the fault of the defendants. I would now like to move on to addressing the test for, for frustration, Madam. In the case of Davis Contractors Limited and Fairham Urban District Council, the appeal court identified that frustration occurs whenever the law recognises that without default of either party on a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. Therefore, Madam, the destruction of the potato crop made the contract, contract impossible to perform or radically different from that which was originally intended between the claimant and the defendant. Madam, in the case of Howell and Coupland, the unforeseen, this case, this was a case, um, my apologies, madam, um, similar to the instance case about um, a farmer and um, their potato crops. And it was held that the unforeseen potato blight, which caused the reduced amount of potatoes being harvested, actually released the seller from his obligation to deliver any more than what had been harvested. Therefore, madam, this greatly applies in this instant case due to the unforeseen potato blight destroying all of the defendant's crops, which automatically terminated the contract at the point of destruction. Madam, I would now like to move on to address clause three of the contractual terms made between the defendant and the claimant. It appears, madam, that the, the claimant has debated the ambiguity of the contractual terms at clause three, therefore leading the defence to provide clarity on what the correct meaning of clause three actually is. Madam, for the doctrine of frustration to be applicable, the contract must not allocate the risk of the supervening event, so in this instant case, the destruction of the potato crop, happening to either the defendant or the claimant. The correct construction of clause three, one and two is therefore vital. And therefore it is the defendant, the defence's case that the contract did not expressly allocate the risk of the supervening event. And the defendant had every intention of delivering these potatoes to the claimant. Madam, in the case of Wood and Capita Insurance Services Limited, this was a Supreme Court case held in 2017 where the Supreme Court had clarified that the court must ascertain the objective meaning of the language which the parties have chosen to express in their agreement. Therefore, the specific wordings must be adhered to that both parties chose to express in their agreement, Madam. For instance, where it states in Clause 31A that the defendant promises, having produced, for the defendant, um, the hundred uh, for the claimant, um, madam, hundred tons of potatoes rather than having purchased. These are quite specific words, madam. And in addition to this, in order for the potatoes to be delivered, they must go through a riddling process first, as previously mentioned, madam, that the claimant was clearly aware of, as it clearly states that in the contract. Riddling is a process whereby, not that the court needs reminding of this, madam, but whereby the potatoes will be sized, graded and inspected for any disease or research before being bagged and delivered. Therefore, madam, it would be very unethical of the defendant to bag and deliver the potatoes without having inspected the potatoes first before delivery. Had they have done that, this would have essentially led to further issues, madam. But as the defendant is a reputable company, as the claimant has recognised, as they were the first to approach the defendant, it would only be reasonable and ethical for the company to, to the company, to so the defendants, to ensure that the, the potatoes go through this riddling process first, madam. The obligations of the defendant under clause, clause three were purely conditional upon the claimant having the goods delivered to them and then making payment. No payment was made prior. 
Therefore, madam, the defendant did not benefit in any way prior to this or at this point as no payment was made. As So there would be no reason why the defendant would not fulfil their contractual duties in delivering these potatoes. Unless, madam, a supervenient, supervenient event had occurred, which in this case has happened, madam. I would now like to move on to address another my next point in addition to this. So in the alternative, as it does state in, as it is section um, 51.3 of the Sales of Goods Act 1979, that the claimant relies upon, after extensive research, madam, it is actually section 7 of the Sales of Goods Act that applies in this case, as it specifically states, where there is an agreement to sell specific goods and subsequently the goods without any fault of the part of the seller or the buyer perish before the risk passes to the buyer, the agreement is avoided. Therefore, the potatoes were specific goods as clearly stated in the contract, madam. There are no other goods that are stated in this contract. So the wording is, is very clear. And but due to the potato blight of no fault of either the claimant or the defendant, this resulted in the agreement being avoided, which the case of Howell and Coopland, as previously mentioned, further confirms, madam. I would now like to move on to address my next point in addressing CPR 13.31b. In relation to the defence um, not being filed on time, madam, this was actually down to the fact that the defendant's instructing solicitor unfortunately had been involved in a serious car accident which occurred after work on the 14th of June 2020. And as she sustained serious injuries, she'd only recently returned to work due to that office um, and due to that office being extremely small of that firm, no one else was able to pick up the case and therefore the deadline was missed for the defence to be filed. And when the solicitor actually returned to work, madam, the solicitor had a backload of numerous cases, including the defendants, hence um, the backlog and the further delays. But might I also add, madam, is that the acknowledgement of service of proceedings was actually um, filed on the 3rd of June 2020. It was just the defence that wasn't filed in time due to this unforeseen um, event. Madam, in the case of Mitchell and News Group newspaper, the Court of Appeal clarified what will constitute a good reason as such as this, which was actually stated at paragraph 42. A good reason would be where if the defaulting party or his solicitor suffered from a debilitating illness or was involved in a car accident. And then it was they went on further to say that good reasons are likely to arise from circumstances that are outside the control of the party in default. And therefore, um, madam, in this instant case, this is a good reason um, to demonstrate why the defence was not filed in time as a solicitor was involved in an unforeseen um, accident and which was completely out of the control of the defendant or the solicitor. Madam, I would now like to move on to my next point in addressing CPR 13.32. When the defendant received the default notice in the post on the 26th of August, they immediately contacted the solicitor on the same day. And considering it was the weekend and the bank holiday, the solicitor filed the defence along with the witness statement on behalf of the defendant on the 1st of September 2020, which was within three working days. And therefore, the application was filed promptly, madam. And therefore, it is the defence's case that there, this is a good reason as to why the defence was filed on time, was not filed on time, my apologies, madam, and as soon as the defendant was aware of the default judgment, the defendant had um, contacted their solicitor immediately. 
In addition to the court's discretion to set aside the default judgment in a CPR 13.3, not that the court needs reminding, madam, but the court must consider CPR 3.9 principles, which is set out in three stages, which is laid out in the case of Denton and White, which was in 2014, in order for the application to be dealt with justly, which further confirms and provides further guidance on that in the Mitchell case. So the first one being assessing the seriousness and the significance of the default. The second being reasons why the default occurred. And the third being to consider all the circumstances of the case included in CPR 3.9, 1A and B. Madam, it is the defence's case that there has been little prejudice to the claimant in the short delay and therefore the breach cannot be said to be serious or significant. Additionally, the reasons why the default occurred was completely out of the defendant's and the instructing solicitor's control. And therefore, in pursuance of the draft order that has been enclosed, the defence invite the court respectively to order that Firstly, the default judgment entered on 24th of August 2020 is to be set aside. Secondly, the draft defence filed in support of this application shall stand as the, as the defendant's defence. Thirdly, the claim to be allocated to the multi-track. And lastly, for the claimant to pay the defendant's costs in this application. If there are no further questions, madam, those are my submissions.